So as I mentioned earlier, we have an innovation panel that we're introducing to the program this year, and uh, we'll kick it off uh, with Doug and Suresh, and uh, I'll let you take the lead on it. Yeah, we're going to take a few minutes and try to give you some examples of innovation that's happening, that are ha happening across the company, and um, we'll try to do that with some speed, and maybe talk a little bit about how it's happening as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that we've been innovating and operating on top of a, a legacy tech stack that, as you would imagine through our acquisitions as we've grown internationally and built a business historically, ends up being a series of systems and it needs to be simplified and, and modernized. As we do that, we'll find our way towards more speed, more innovation and more, more productivity. And Suresh Kumar, who I briefly introduced earlier, joined us in July, um, came from Google is the type of leader who can lead that type of investment and, and lead it well, and we're really excited to have you. And Suresh, if you would, start off kind of with kind of that big picture question. Let's talk a little bit about what it means to modernize the technology that we have at Walmart today. Absolutely. So, a few pieces. Um, having the right talent, creating the right structures, and then creating the right architecture that will allow us to incorporate new technologies, whether it is vision or voice. These are the things that will allow us to develop innovative solutions on behalf of our customers or for our, uh, our uh, associates. Now we have great engineers, we have great data scientists and other technologists. We are creating structures to make them even more effective so that they can drive leverage and reuse. Uh, we are creating deeper uh, expertise in areas like machine learning and the cloud. And in terms of architecture, the cloud is at the center of everything that, that we are doing. But we are not just taking our old legacy complex applications and simply just moving them to the cloud. We are rebuilding them so that they can take advantage of what the cloud really has to offer. So for example, in the, um, in, in the store associates, by building applications to be cloud native, we can incorporate things like voice assistance into them. And this is something that the legacy architecture would never allow us to be able to do. And so these are some of the, the ways in which we can go faster and be a lot more innovative. I'm excited about the plan and I'm excited about doing it faster. Let's um, go deeper into the architecture and talk a bit more about what a hybrid cloud actually means, what it means at Walmart. Absolutely. So we have built out a large and sophisticated cloud on which we are building all the modern stack and the modern applications. So we have got a private cloud that we have installed inside our data centers. We are partnering with public cloud providers, and we are building out edge computing uh, in our stores. So this combination is a hybrid cloud architecture that is uniquely suited for what we want. So we can take workloads and we can move them seamlessly from the private cloud to public cloud to make use of the flex capacity when we need it. This is something that we did very effectively last holiday season. We can make use of the specialized compute capabilities that the, pub, the public cloud offers so that we can run our complex workloads, whether it is um, training machine learning models, big data, these things run very effectively on the, on the public cloud. And then finally, we can take our applications and use the edge that we are building out to move them closer to where our associates and our customers are inside the store so that we can improve the, the customer experience. So it is these three pieces that are coming together that form the underpinning of the modern stack that, that we are building out. I hope this is starting to connect some dots for you. We want to get faster. We want to get more innovative. We know we can use technology to be more productive. And in today's accounting world, a lot of the tech that we build is more on the OPEX side than the CAPEX side. So we mentioned earlier in our guidance, we've got this increased investment in technology that in a period of years, we can position ourselves to be even stronger and better. It's one of the governors that we can use as we manage earnings. How fast do we go? Does this happen in two years, three years, four years? It's not a lot more than that, but it's also not in a year. So it's one of the variables that you might keep in mind as you think about the, the guidance that we gave you earlier. So now imagine the tech stack's been modernized, and all these emerging technologies are now available to us to serve customers in different ways. And you hear about all these various things. Mark mentioned some of them earlier today. 
which ones do you think are most relevant and practical to move the needle for Walmart? No, absolutely. So we are already incorporating a lot of the many emerging technologies and new technologies, whether it is IoT, Internet of Things, blockchain, um, voice, vision, uh, robotics, and so on. But there is one technology that I'm particularly excited about because it has relevance in pretty much every single thing that we do, and that's machine learning, or ML. So with ML, we can improve our customer experience, we can make our associates' lives a lot easier, and we can reduce costs by driving more efficiency. So let me give one example. This is a project that we call Smart Substitutions. So imagine that you are an associate and you're picking items on behalf of our, of our customers inside the store. And as you are picking items, you find that one of the items that the customer wants just went out of stock. That happens occasionally. So at this time, you want to go find an alternate product, a substitute if you would, to offer to our customers so that they don't get disappointed. This used to be very error-prone manual. It was a very difficult task. In fact, our associates used to have a piece of printed paper with a bunch of rules written on them so that they could go find out what is the best uh, substitute for that particular product. Well, this is where we leveraged ML to, uh, to come and help. We trained a model that extracted information from about the products that we sell, inferred relationships between them, combined that with customer preferences. Now the result is that we automatically figure out the best substitute and we direct our associates to go pick that. Associates are very happy. They don't, they don't need to stop what they're doing and go on trying to hunt for the, the product. But equally important, our customers are very happy because the product that the machine learning algorithm picks up is unique, personalized for what the customer wants in that particular uh, instance. And so this is the power of ML that, that we want to leverage everywhere in, in what we do. We have a lot of focus on the accuracy of first-time pick rate, but when we have to do a substitution, it needs to be as seamless as possible. So Absolutely. we'll try to eliminate them, and then the ones that we have will make better. Um, let's wrap up with data. Um, Walmart's used information for a long time to help us with in-stock replenishment. Our suppliers have been very helpful in helping us manage the information that we've had, but we've never really focused on customer data to the maximum of our capability, and there are other places where we can monetize and use data more effectively, personalize the experience for customers, et cetera. How do you view the opportunity in front of us as it relates to data? Absolutely, so um, Walmart is unique. Like we said, we have over 260 million people walking into our stores every week around the world. That gives us a huge set of information from which we can draw insights to help serve our customers even better. And that's something that, that we want to do, that we are committed to doing, but we want to do that in a way that is extremely mindful of the trust that they place in us. I talked about personalization, I talked about uh, machine learning, let me give you another example, which is online grocery pickup. This is something that our customers love to uh, love as a feature because they can book a slot, drive up, and we have the product uh, load, loaded into their, uh, into their vehicle. But nobody wants to wait for too long. They don't want to wait for the, the slot, and they don't want to wait inside their cars. So this is where data helps, right? So we looked at the data around how the slots are getting booked, and we started predicting which slots are going to get filled up soon, we put that in front of the customer so that they could select which slot it is that, that would work best for them. Similarly, we started looking at not just customer information, but we also started getting data around how our stores are actually uh, functioning, what the, the parking lot uh, looks like. And we combined that with information and data surrounding the stores, traffic patterns, construction, and so on. The result is that we can predict very, very accurately when a particular customer is actually going to show up for their pickup order, meaning that now, we can serve them just in time. Times go down, customers are happy, but it also ends up creating a, a flywheel effect where you know, the better we serve our customers, the more deeply engaged they are with us, and that gives us more opportunities to serve them even better. Got it. Suresh, really excited about your leadership. Glad you're here at Walmart. 
we're not going to wait to keep driving innovation until all of this work is done. These things will be happening in parallel, and we're going to give you some more examples of what's already underway. Suresh, thanks for coming up. Thank you. I now want to ask Dakona Smith and Jamie Iannone to come up for a few minutes. Welcome, Dakona. Jamie, we'll Sir? start with you. Yeah. Um, Jamie leads membership marketing, samsclub.com, at Sam's. He drives the product mindset. He works closely with the technology team. He's been with us for six years now? Yep, six years. And before that was with Barnes & Noble leading digital products, and then it's at eBay for seven years leading search and some other areas there before, before making his way to join us, which we're really glad that you did. Um, lots of cool stuff happening at Sam's. I mean, for us to be able to stand up today and say that Sam's Club has become a tech incubator, incubator is really cool. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for your leadership as it relates to making that happen. Kath talked about Scan and Go. Let's lean into kind of the product itself, what the future looks like for it first, if you would. Yeah, Scan and Go really started from two associates, entrepreneurs really, who said, what if we could take one of the pain points or friction points in shopping, uh, the checkout lines, and avoid it all together by giving people a point of sale right on the mobile phone they're already carrying? Uh, so they worked on this in late 2016, uh, launched it, and members fell in love with the product. Uh, instantly a hit, very highly rated, high uh, repeat rate. So we rolled it out to the whole fleet pretty quickly. Uh, and since then, nothing but really good feedback from our members about using Scan and Go. We wanted to continue to innovate and push the envelope. So one of our big requests was we'd like to be able to purchase adult beverages with Scan and Go as well. So we added that over the course of this year. Did that uh, idea come up at about 5 p.m. on a, one day? Or? All the time, we, Sundays before football. Um, <laughs> so um, that's been a big success. And then they also wanted to integrate it into the core experience. So we integrated it into one app, the Sam's Club app. If you went to the iOS store today, it's 4.9 stars. Members just have the, the best things to say about it. So they've continued to push the envelope on innovation. Uh, what they're working on now is how do we eliminate the need to even scan the actual barcode. So we've talked about Sam's Club now, which is our tech innovation club in Dallas. And there we're doing a test where you just point the camera at the item and it recognizes. So you just hold it over the avocados you and it to says... scan a barcode or anything? No. And it says, would you like to add the avocados? They go right to the bag. And people look at that and they think, wow, that's like magic. That's really cool. And, and that's what our product and tech teams kind of live for, is for a customer to say, wow, that was like magic. That's a, that's a home run. Love that. Um, we've talked a lot about Ask Sam today, but I'd appreciate it if you'd go deeper into how that product was built. You know, when we, we get excited because we think about all these footsteps, associates all over our clubs and stores, running all over the place to get information and how efficient it is. It's been fun to see how Ask Sam has taken hold at Sam's. What, how did that story come about? How do you build something like that? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. Uh, Dakota and John always talked about how do we make sure that our associates can be on the floor helping our members all the time. We never want them to have to go get data in the back room, et cetera. And how do we make it really easy so we come to work at Sam's Club? Um, it's very intuitive how to work there. So we thought, well, if we could just take a voice assistant and have you talk to the phone and, and let it answer common questions, like how do I cut a ribeye steak or how many plus members have we signed up today, um, that would make it really easy. So that's what we did. Take a look at this video of our associates using Ask Sam's. What does Amy Brown work today? Um, it gives us their schedule for the day, and that way we know who's coming in. Hey, Sam's, do we have vacuums? It literally gives me everything in the club that we have right there instead of having to ask the floor people all the time for a product if we have it in stock. It's good just to have it right in front of me. How do I make enchiladas? So it gives you the spec sheet, and if you click on it, it'll bring up the exact uh, spec sheet for that specific item. It saves time from going to and from the office, uh, allows us to be on the floor much more um, with our associates, and we can interact with them instead of having to run away from them to get a specific report. Um, we can spend a whole lot more time with them and the members as well. Yeah, so we're excited about this. You know, we often talk about small, empowered teams. So engineers, product managers, and, and designers designing a great product. This was 11 engineers over five months that built this product. Uh, and what's great is it's a, it's a self-learning product. So what we tell our associates, the more questions you ask it, the smarter it's going to get. So they started asking it questions like, can you print the sign for broccoli? And it didn't have that capability yet, but it quickly learned how to do it, and we included it. And now they're using it for things like printing signs when they're out there on the floor. So it's Maybe really- we ask it how to forecast sales in December. <laughs> we apparently need to work on that. Uh, did it tell you anything? Yeah. Suresh talked about AI and machine learning, so we <laughs> put, it all, put it all in there. <laughs> 
Kath and I were in a Sam's Club in Florida a few weeks ago, and there was this one section that looked like it had too many SKUs for a warehouse club, and so we were wondering if the club had it set wrong, and we asked the club manager, can you show us the layout for this particular section? He pulled his phone out, asked the Sam's Club app, and it pulls up the exact layout, and sure enough, he's got it set just right. It was our problem, not his problem, and he was very pleased to point that out to us after <laughs> we got through showing it to him. Thanks, Jamie. So you worked at Walmart for a long time. How many years with the company, Dakota? Almost 30. 30. What was your first job? Cart pusher. You come a long way. Assembling bikes and cart pusher. And now when you show up at a store to go visit, what's the first thing you do? Probably grab a shopping cart and push it inside? <laughs> That's exactly right. I haven't come it that just far. Didn't, it doesn't come that far. That's right. So you leave Walmart, you go to Sam's Club, and you spend about a year over there, and you see how the team's working as it relates to products like this. And now you move back over to Walmart US to run all, all of operations. Congratulations. Thank you. Are you, are you going to steal the Ask Sam? Product? We're already doing it. Jamie, you don't know, I'm meeting with his team regularly. <laughs> all of, moving all of his tech over to, to Walmart. No, but Ask Sam is just a good example of many tech products that uh, Jamie delivered to the, to the clubs at Sam's. You know, Ask Sam puts all of that technology right in the associate's hand. So you can only imagine all the modulars that we set, uh, all the planograms, asking for prices, locations, all of that now can be done by voice. So thank you, Jamie. <laughs> you helped the whole company, Jamie. Quite a deal. Love it. Love to see the impact. <laughs> I mentioned Spark earlier, the independent contractor platform. Would you tell everybody a little bit more about it? What's the future look like for Spark? Yeah, Spark is our in-house uh, delivery platform. and. Uh, uh, basically, what you, it, it uses crowdsourced uh, drivers. Basically, what you do is you go to uh, driveforspark.com. Uh, you can sign up to uh, uh, make deliveries. You have to pass a few checks, of course. So, uh, but you pass a couple of checks, and you can download the app. And the app will tell uh, tell you everything you need to do to complete a successful delivery. So, if you're in I don't know New Orleans or Nashville on vacation, and you need to make a little extra money. We can help you out. You can go, <laughs> you can go to Drive for Spark, and uh, we can put you to work. But uh, it is, it is, give us a lot of flexibility. It's going to give us some flexibility to understand the Indian, uh, the Indian use of, uh, of delivery, uh, more options to serve our, our our customers. And as you know, Doug, for over the last couple of years, we've been we've been expanding. We've launched and really scaled our same day grocery delivery, and we've used uh, last mile delivery partners to help us with that. So if you think about Spark, it can help us uh, provide flexibility and some learning. So that's, uh, it'll be really positive for us. Just you. one of the ways we'll solve last mile. That's you know, exactly We're working right. on autonomous vehicles. We're working with partners. In the case of in-home, we want it to be our own associates. There's a menu of ways for us to, to solve last mile for customers, and we're working on that. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Appreciate you coming up. Thanks, Dave. I want to invite a couple more folks to come up. Karthik. Ragaputhi leads strategic development and business development for PhonePay. Karthik and Kathleen McLaughlin is our chief sustainability officer. Karthik, I'll start with you. Um, we've, we've covered PhonePay to some extent, but you've been there for the beginning, and you understand this better than anybody else. In your own words, how would you describe PhonePay to this group? Sure. So, Doug, we are a technology company, and we're on a mission to unlock the flow of money and access to services. So in Hindi, phone pay quite literally means on the phone. And we use the English connotation of the word pay to create that connection with everything to do with money on the phone. Got it. So there's a use case that starts with payment in India, and then it expands from there. Now, we've all seen what happened with WeChat and how Tencent led that. Um, these use cases, as they grow, do they result in what some people call a super app? Yeah, let me start answering that question with a short video. Okay. <laughs> Anticipated Phone that one, did you? India's leading platform is liberating the flow of money and services between consumers, banks, and businesses, and accelerating progress for nearly 200 million Indians. Used by every fourth Indian, trusted by 10 million merchants. The platform powers a staggering 500 million plus transactions every month, 
and enables the flow of almost $180 billion annually. With PhonePay, users can chat with anyone from their contact book and also send money in seconds for free. Make quick, easy payments anywhere from a street hawker to a high-end store and everyone else in between. Pay for online shopping, travel, bills and mobile recharges in an instant. With PhonePay Switch, users get access to a world of apps at just one place. What's more, they can pay using any payment mode of their choice. And that's not all. With PhonePay, users are also securing and growing money by investing in options like gold, mutual funds and insurance. PhonePay, fueling progress for millions in India. So the short answer to your question, Doug, is yes, but in a much more broad and powerful sense than the traditional notion of a super app. So at PhonePay, we are driven by technology to offer everyone an equal opportunity to access money and services. And specifically, we think this manifests in three dimensions of what we would call a super app, consumers, merchants, and banks. So firstly, on the consumer side, we believe in enabling equal access, regardless of location or socioeconomic status. And we take great pride in the fact that more than 65% of our nearly 200 million users are from small towns and villages all over India. I think this is a testament to the power of technology to really democratize access. So secondly, on the merchant side, we work with about 10 million merchants, the majority of whom are small and medium enterprises. And we're actively working on driving their growth by connecting them to our consumer network. So for example, as Judith mentioned earlier, we recently launched the PhonePay ATM, which is a revolutionary first-in-market innovation that has totally transformed the ATM landscape in India. It simultaneously solves for a consumer pain point of access to ATMs, while also driving more footfall to our merchant partners and thereby drives their growth. And then thirdly, on the banking side, when you connect consumers and merchants together, money lies at the heart of this intersection, and all our use cases are aimed at unlocking the flow of money. So phone pays users can use us to transfer money to each other, to pay their bills, to spend money both at online and offline merchants, and manage and grow their money using financial products like gold, insurance, and mutual funds. So yes, we are a super app. Got it. So some people might be a little confused about the ATM reference. Actually, what's happening is India's generation skipping ATMs. That's right. It's digital money dispersed frequently at Karanas. That's right. That's another example of how innovation is occurring in India and innovations occurring within Walmart. Um, we're really excited about PhonePay. That's why we've talked about it so much today. But we're just as excited about Flipkart and Mintra. And the way this, as I mentioned to you in our last meeting, the way these pieces fit together to create a mutually reinforcing ecosystem is super interesting to us. Business models are changing. The retail business model has changed and is changing. And we're learning a lot, Judith, from what's happening in India and applying that across the company in an increasing way. And really appreciative of you, you and the team. Please thank everybody for us. Um, it might surprise you to know that in my job, sometimes things get announced at Walmart that I've never heard of until I've read about them in the news. Well, I know that's not supposed to be the case. I'm supposed to hear about everything internally. But actually, today, there is so much happening across the company that it's true that we're solving problems and innovating in ways that I haven't heard about sometimes until I've read about it. And I actually love that. And I try to be careful not to ask too many questions when that's the case because it will slow people down and they'll want to clear everything with leadership. And we don't want them to do that. We have common values, we have a culture, you know what problems you need to go solve, go solve the problems. That's an important ingredient as it relates to speed. So when we were talking about telling you some innovation stories and tech stories, it was exciting for me to hear Kathleen McLaughlin, her story and what her team has been doing to take technology and put it to work to tackle some of the biggest problems we face as humans. Um, Kathleen is a global shaper as it relates to thought leadership and policy and we're really thankful that she's part of Walmart helping us all become chief sustainability officers. And if you would, Kathleen, tell them about how we're deploying tech to help with things like climate change. Yeah. Well, climate is one of the biggest issues that we face in the whole environmental and social landscape. And what we're trying to do at Walmart is take issues that are relevant for our business, for our customers, our associates, communities, uh, and address them through our business assets in a way that not only helps the world move quicker to transform, to address these issues, but it's also good for business. And climate is a great example. Um, you know, we've been working, Doug, 
as you well know, since 2005, in earnest on our own emissions from operations. We've doubled fleet efficiency. We're on our way to 50% renewable energy, powering all of our stores. We're working on energy efficiency, on, on, on refrigerants, all of these things. But of course, for a retailer and in the consumer goods industry in general, 90% of the emissions are not in retail operations. They're in the supply chain. And it's things like you know agriculture, waste, food waste, packaging waste, uh, the design of consumer products themselves, deforestation, things like this. So a couple years back, we set a science-based target for emissions reduction. We were, I think, the first retailer uh, to do so. And we said, OK, scope one, scope two, we've got it. Question is, how do we tackle all of those emissions in the supply chain? So we launched an effort called Project Gigaton, which is powered by a digital platform to help our suppliers engage and work with us to accelerate emissions reduction all across supply chains. And there's three things that are pretty exciting about it. Um, one is it's science-based, but it's very practical. So we worked with World Wildlife Fund, with Environmental Defense Fund, to develop a bunch of super practical interventions that suppliers can take in supply chains and translate them through calculators into emissions reduction. So it's very easy for people to engage in this and get started and start working on emissions reduction. Second thing is, because of that, it democratizes access. Kartik, you talked about this. We, you know, that, that's a theme that runs throughout Walmart. We want to democratize access to things, and this is no different. We now have 2,300 suppliers working on this, signed up working on initiatives to reduce emissions. And I think you mentioned this earlier, Doug. We're over 200 million metric tons of emissions avoided. It's actually north of 250 at this point, just a couple years in. So that's great, well on our way to that gigaton target. Um, and the third thing is, the way we set it up with the platform and incentives and um, you know, help for suppliers, it's a bit of an escalator in terms of ambition and impact. Right? So people can come in, it's very easy to get started, but then we ratchet them up in terms of their own ambition and what they're able to achieve. So we've got incentives for what we call gigagurus. These are of the 2,300 suppliers, the hundreds that have SMART goals, that have reported results, and so on. Uh, and, we're, and we're excited about that because um, it allows us to keep the standards high of what does it really mean to ma be making progress on this, but have a broad church get people in and move them up that escalator toward that, that goal. We just received an A from CDP on climate action, which we're really proud about. I think it makes us one of, I don't know, 30 companies out of 8,000 that submitted to CDP to get that score. Uh, so I just say, watch this space. You know, we're going to continue to innovate here and, and with our whole ESG agenda to try to drive impact in a way that really does create value uh, as well for business. I mentioned earlier this, this idea of business serving multi-stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I think you gave us several good examples of how reaching out to suppliers or thinking about the planet or, or communities is actually really good business because eliminating waste helps us fulfill our purpose of saving people money so they can live better. And sometimes that waste takes the form of carbon, sometimes it's plastics. And we're trying to work across the whole system, be systems thinkers, and drive an overall optimization of our business model, not a sub-optimization. And I hope through these examples you can see that Culturally, we've, we're there, our mindset's there, and we're doing good work, and we know that we can do more, and Kathleen, appreciate your leadership in making that happen. Well, thanks. Thank Likewise. you very much. Thanks. Karthik, thank you. Thank you. We're going to um, pivot now to the Q&A portion, and I'm going to invite the team to come up and join me up here, and, and Dan will help facilitate, and we'll open it up for any question on any subject that you all want to ask, and Paul's hand went up first. Yeah, Dan. I saw that. He was early. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> He's not wasting any time. Again, if you could just state your name and firm name, that'd be appreciated for the webcast. With your one hand. <laughs> um, thank you for all the information provided today. Wanted to maybe first focus on the US operation. Um, one of the keys to success is the collaboration between John and Mark's team. Maybe let's just dig into that a little bit and speak about that collaboration and maybe even that friction 
as we think about balancing growth and being a more profitable company. And as a part of that conversation, maybe just bucket for us, what are the, what are the omni-channel initiatives really enabling this year's guidance? And then if we were to think about if you were actually providing a longer framework, what are those items from an omni-channel standpoint that aren't yet at scale today, but will absolutely be a factor over the coming two to three years? Thank you. We probably all want to weigh in on that one. John, why don't you go first? Mark, you go, it. and then I'll, others can jump in. Yeah, Paul, thanks for the question. Um, first, first, I think it's important that between Mark and I, there's a lot of collaboration. We spend a lot of time working together, thinking about how we serve customers, whether it's in store, or pickup, channels. And uh, you know, really, the lines are pretty blurry between e-commerce stores and how we think about Omni. And what I'm, I'm most excited about and energized by is, is thinking about putting the customer at the center and then building everything in our ecosystem around the needs of the customer and then between all of our businesses and the tools that we've got available, being able to serve the customer any way they want to be served, whether it's at home or direct to home, the refrigerator, other services like health and wellness. So you know, thinking about it, um, for us, as we look forward, it's all about the customer, finding ways that we can create new ways for growth, and then layer on top of it innovation that works across all the channels. But I'm really excited about the work we've been doing. Yeah, no, as, as John said, uh, the lines are blurred. We think about the business as one, as one US business. And, and like John said, there's one customer at the center. Uh, we've been on a journey now the last couple of years. You know, we, we brought in a chief customer officer, uh, Janie and uh, brought the customer org together. We recently brought together the supply chain under Greg Smith. Um, so the orgs are starting to come together and, and I, think it's, I think it's working well. Uh, both the chief customer officer and, and, and Greg running supply chain has really helped us you know, create a real true end-to-end -end omni experience. And I think merchandising is, is sort of the next area that we're, we're focused on and looking at right now. But even, even still, you know, un underneath um, the people running both areas of e-com and stores, like the, the GMs of those businesses are working very closely together, more so than ever before, I think. Mm -hmm. In the late 90s, I was the general merchandise manager for electronics, books, sporting goods, stationery, and some other categories, and could see what was happening with e-commerce with e-toys and Amazon starting to sell books and those kinds of changes. And going way back then, you know, we were even thinking about spinning out Walmart.com and having it be a separate entity separate from Walmart to create speed and the investment. From the late 90s all the way through until kind of these last few years, I've seen the fits and starts with Walmart trying to get really committed to e-commerce and make it happen and um, would love to do some of that over again if we could do it over again and kept some separation between stores and e-commerce because I had seen a large profitable established business in large and small ways diminish the emerging investment business, if I can call it that. And Clay Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, influenced me a lot. And having had conversations with him and read the book and studied it, I concluded we gotta keep this separate for a little while. But the issue is the customer keeps pulling it together. They want one experience for the brand. And so what we've got to have is we've got to have a leadership team that gets Omni and believes in Omni and supports the whole thing. People that work in e-commerce that want to help stores, people that work in stores that want to help e-commerce. And over time, this ends up being one business and one thing. So Mark mentioned the customer org and the supply chain org. There'll be other changes that come along, but we've got to set ourselves up so that the whole thing can innovate and move with speed in an omni fashion. And I really do appreciate how everybody has worked together these last few years, but there's a whole nother gear to get to to make this happen in a faster way. And I think it's time to really this, this next year and maybe a little bit beyond kind of finish that off and have one, one omni org still with a great diverse team thinking about how we solve these problems. But in the end, one customer proposition that's seamless. And you asked about what does that unlock looking ahead. I mean, just think about how easy we can make it to do merchandise returns when somebody wants to do a merchandise return. Uh, think about how we can connect up payment. Think about how we can use data when we have one version of the customer. We know who they are and we know what they've consumed across the channels. There are lots of little unlocks that will occur as we get even better at that. And I'm, and I'm really excited about it. On that too, I think, you know, even across formats, as I'm thinking about my member base, what are the things that John's doing really well with Mark that, that we can then import across to Sam? So 
Um, so if you think about even what you're doing with Spark Delivery, I mean, that is great as we're leaning into Ship From Club. So I think, you know, as you think about your format, what are those things that are, are working in other formats from an Omni perspective that you can just steal and go fast with? Next to uh, Ed on the far side. Hi, thanks. This is Ed, you're at KeyBank uh, Capital Markets. Quick question for you guys. You, you seem like you're starting to test and lean more into services in the Superstore. Um, I know you've always had some service component, restaurants, or things like that. What, what's different this time, and what filters are you looking for in order to determine whether you do a broader rollout? Thanks. I think the first one um, that I would speak about is the, are the initiatives in healthcare. Um, and, it, and it really all goes back to what customers need and our ability to serve customers and call it 5,000 communities all around for just a second gives us an interesting ability to be able to help a lot of customers with the things that they need. You know, another area um, when they're in the store and they need to, or on the website and they want to finance an item they're buying, we can, we can help with that, whether it's us or a partner or some combination thereof. But there are a number of ways that customers need to be able to close all their transactions and, and I'm excited about both those opportunities. As Doug said, we've got a, a big base, we've got a lot of data, and there are things we can do to make people's lives easier on their behalf, and, and Walmart's well, seated, well suited to do that. Uh, go right here to Bob Durable. Just a question on the, the Walmart, it's Bob Durable from Guggenheim. Um, question on the, the Walmart apparel offering, you know, some of the learnings from December, but as you think about the mix of business, opening price points versus brands, I'd be curious to hear from both of you guys if, if you could talk about, you know, the importance of branded apparel in the mix and like what you're doing online with branded apparel, being able to maybe move some of it into the stores and, and, and sort of how you're working together on making the apparel business better. Yeah, traditionally, the way that the merchants would think about apparel is, and I mentioned this earlier, is call it the, the fashion pyramid. We've got basics, fashion basics, then we've got fashion at the top of it. And in the store assortment, um, in the last year or so, has been focused at the lower end of that, even at, at points where we need to expand up. But having an aligned team between Denise and the Deanna of Bentonville working together, we can, we can use the website for, for different things that we can use the stores for, and they'll complement each other. And I think it's important to just you know, think of that thread that goes from the fashion business into the basics, and then there are different items that we can share across and others that you may be able to do online that we don't do in the store. Yeah, maybe for example, Scoot is a great example of Sofia Vergara. Mm -hmm. um, both those brands were, were online first and, and now in stores, and, and we, we see that, that trend continuing. There are opportunities for um, you know, branded assortment that we create that's proprietary going across dot-com and stores. But I think both home and, and apparel are examples of, of the two teams working closely together and, and then they can extend assortments in ways that they couldn't on their own. And uh, home, you know, we're talking about home, apparel, but home in particular has had a lot of success early. And uh, Anthony and Jeff, the two people that lead the business, have done a really nice job pairing up what's in the store as the core, and then they complement it on the site with the long tail, and customers are responding really well. Okay, we'll go to Chris next, and then Michael Lasser after that. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris Orvers, JP Morgan. Can you talk about the fulfilled by Walmart vision a little bit more? How much of this is the tails of the assortment versus, say, that first one million SKUs that you've talked about that drive 80% of all the transactions? Is it sort of a recognition that you're not getting the coverage as fast as you want, or maybe you're not getting the access to the brands as quickly as you want? And then just broadly, what's the puts and takes of 1P versus 3P? Yeah, so uh, Walmart for Human Services is a critical uh, part of our strategy. Um, you mentioned it, it's definitely brought in an assortment. So there are uh, merchants on third party that we want to have that simply don't have fulfillment capabilities and so we're not able to get that assortment uh, on the website. So that's really the first priority is to really focus on on those brands and, and getting uh, assortment for customers. Also just having the stuff in our warehouse allows us to offer uh, a better customer experience. It allows us to commingle the product in the same box when we ship it out with first party, which helps the economics. So there's lots of reasons to like the business. We're, we're feeling good about the start. We've built the technology. We've got a handful of sellers using it. They like it. We're seeing good results. Um, but it's something that we're going to you know, take slowly, make sure it's, it's right before we really um, you know, blow it out. Just as a follow-up, it seemed like initially it was, well, if we get coverage up to that 1 million SKUs, we don't necessarily have to go beyond. So I guess 
What I'm trying to understand is what's changed now that you're doing it? It was more of like, okay, we're good at this now when we're moving to the next level, or was there something that you felt like the strategy wasn't addressing? Yeah, no, it was always part of the strategy. It was just a matter of uh, you know, getting to it. Uh, the top million SKUs is definitely an area of focus to get those in our warehouse because it does represent you know, a large percentage of sales. But the goal is still to carry everything. So we definitely want to carry everything that a customer might want when they come to walmart.com. And we, we may have failed to communicate clearly at times, including me, about the one or two million being first party versus everything. I mean, we never thought 1P plus 3P was a million or two SKUs. We were focused on 1P as we were answering those questions. So it'll be a much bigger assortment when you put 3P with it. Michael Lasser. UBS. The market's perception is that Walmart's been on, especially in the US, Walmart's been on this journey over the last few years where there's been an investment in price, there's been an investment in people, and now the company's starting to harvest those returns so, um, and at the same time, it's, it's e-commerce profitability stabilizing such that the totality of the U.S. business, the margin there is stable and can continue to be stable from here. A, is that a reasonable expectation? And B, what are the two or three factors that might have to, that might arise to motivate the company to say, hey, we have to make further sizable investments and bring down our profitability from here? And then totally unrelated to that, before Carrie takes away the microphone. <laughs> you go first? Ha have you won the war against the hard discounters? Or could the battle reemerge such that those price gaps are going to shrink and you'll have to, as Aldi and Lidl just get bigger and have more stores and you're more competition, that, that we're going to see flare-ups of that over time. Thank you. Maybe, Michael, I'll, I'll kick off. So if you look at the kind of the profitability, <clears throat> excuse me, the profitability of what you saw last year, and particularly the U.S. business, and you see the guidance that we've given this year, pretty similar. And so I think we feel good about this. John can, can tag on a little bit. We feel good about that kind of algorithm, so to speak, for the Walmart U.S. business. We're always going to invest in the business first. And if we see opportunities for things that we think give us a long-term benefit, I think Doug said it this morning, but might have some short-term pressure, we're gonna be upfront with you about that. What we're saying today with the guidance is we think we've invested into things that we feel like we should to make sure we're there for the customer now and in the future. But the customer's gonna to continue to change, competition will continue to change, and we've gotta make sure that we have the ability to, to evolve with that. There's a reason we only give annual guidance. <laughs> it is a fluid environment, and we're making decisions all the time. And when I look ahead and think about what more we wanted, would want to do, it would be things that would help us secure the future of the company. So if we see a window to play offense on something and we think speed's really important, we'd be more aggressive in that way. We would like to pay our people more, and we have been and will continue to be focused on people. That'll be important. But we have put a lot of this on the board. Now we got a lot to work with, a lot of, a lot of variables to, to make decisions around. And, and so I think we've described it earlier in today, or in just now, sufficiently. Yeah, I think the, the sales number, as Brett said earlier, that's about $9 billion of growth, which is a great number for the total business. And it, you know, inside the box and online, we'll always be watching what competitors do. And I wouldn't underestimate any competitor any time. We're, we're constantly scanning and looking and making sure that whatever we've got out to offer is what a customer wants and it makes sense in terms of value. So we'll always be looking and, and we'll decide as we go. As it relates to like hard discount, we don't underestimate them or anybody. Our opening price points are gonna have the right spec and the right sized and priced competitively. And then we have this whole other assortment that we can work with to make sure that we deliver profitability for the business. And I might just add on having competed with hard discounters pretty much my whole retail life. One of the differences for the US is that the price position is much stronger already and it gives you the ability to compete on everything else. That's not necessarily true in every market around the world where the price gap is much wider. So you're already starting from a better position here than I think you would see in other markets. Okay, go to the center right here. 
Morning, Caroline Conway from Alliance Bernstein. I just wanted to ask you about the supply chain support for the omnichannel efforts in stores. It sounds very clear that the super centers are going to be the hub for uh, pickup, of course, and then home delivery. Just curious if there are also investments that you're considering for uh, things like each is picking at the DCs or dark stores or pickup points or anything along those lines. And then a separate second question for Judith. I just wanted to get your perspective on the regulatory environment in India and how that's looking for Flipkart. Yeah, let me take the first part. Um, we showed in, in the presentation earlier this, this idea of something called Alphabot. Um, that's one experiment that we're learning from in, in Salem, New Hampshire, and I said we're, as I said, we're expanding a couple more stores this year. Um, that and similar technologies can work in distribution centers as well. So we're, we're, we're internally rethinking the way that we would define supply chain. Historically, we might have thought about supply chain as the part of the business that brings something from a supplier to the back of the store. But with all the, all the things we're doing today, including Walmart and Home, the supply chain goes from the point of supply all the way to the refrigerator. So every one of those pieces has to be put together and optimized the right way. And there are several different types of technology that we'll be testing, experimenting with to find the best ways to do that. We've got some, a market where we're running automated vehicles, for example. Um, and then we've got, as we said, Spark. Spark is our first multi-tenant platform that we built inside the company. We're tenant number one. Sam's Club will be tenant number two. And that's a platform that can be expanded. So just think of it from the point of that something is grown, manufactured, packaged, all the way to the customer's home is the way we'll optimize this whole entire supply chain. Yeah. So thank you. I was going to add one thing. Another way to think about how, how integrated the supply chain is starting to get, imagine you know, we have uh, regional distribution centers that supply stores in full truckload. Could you move product in full truckload from fulfillment center to RDC to the store? and then ride the rails of last mile delivery to someone's home where we're already delivering groceries and the GM package just rides. Um, so there's just things like that that we're thinking through right now. It's, it's certainly um, you know, a very sort of fluid, fluid process. So for the regulatory environment in India, what I'd say is sometimes people forget we've been operating in India for over 10 years. This is not something that we got used to 18 months ago when we made the investment. So we've had a, a strong cash and carry business there throughout that time. Um, you know, I think actually payments, um, e-commerce, legislation around the world is shifting and changing. Everybody, as these businesses grow, is learning different ways to think about how to look at them. Um, in an emerging market like India, with such a fast-growing part of the business, that's no different either. We continue to work with the Flipkart and the phone pay teams very closely. Their focus on the customer, ultimately, I think is the right thing to do. Keep doing that. And then we work with the government from a perspective of having a seat at the table to talk about these things and to work our way through them. But um, it's something we knew that was there when we, we made the investment. And you know, seeing the results we're seeing, not just for the business itself, but in the impact they're making on broader communities, creating jobs, really thinking about how they support small micro-businesses, Karana shops as well, I think is all part of that landscape. Okay, we'll go to uh, Simeon next and then Peter after that. Thanks, uh, Simeon Gutman, Morgan Stanley. Um, you've always done a great job with your core customer. Um, typically in that demographic, they spend a, a large part of the dis disposable income and you're probably getting the lion's share. The key is breaking into different demographics. That's the future. You're doing it. Your e-commerce business is growing. But can you rate your success, maybe for you, Doug, John, and, and Mark, breaking into new customer demographics? Um, have you any, any specific examples? And then a second question for Judith on um, Flipkart, maybe for also Judith and Brett. Um, when will dilution moderate? Uh, we always talk about uh, losses are consistent with what you expected. I don't think we know exactly what you expected. Should they moderate, given that it's such a, a volatile environment? Thanks. Let's, yeah, you want to go first? yeah let, me, let me start with the, the first question, um, customers and, and demographics. And, and as far as a specific example, um, Simeon, I want to talk about grocery pickup. Um, we've had a, a large, successful grocery business for some time, and, and over the last few years, quality's improved, the assortment range has improved, and you've seen the business accelerate and share go up. And when you can get into the baskets of what's being shopped in grocery pickup, we see more choice beef, we see prime beef, we see wagyu beef show up as a higher percentage, organics and produce and grocery show up. So it, it appears, at least, 
part of this growth is coming from other channels and places because we've been able to marry the assortment with a service that appears uh, that aligns well with someone who's time starved and has higher income levels. So inside the pickup business, really encouraging to see what's happened. And I think those quality levels then enable us to be able to appeal to that consumer across other channels, like the work that Mark and the team are doing online. But some really great examples inside there, item by item. Yeah, we've been pushing up AUR each year on .com as we start to break more premium brands. And we're definitely seeing new customers come in, especially with the proprietary brands, you know, with, with Eloqui, Bonobos, um, all the brands that we've formed. Uh, Scoop is a great example. A lot of, a lot of folks are new to Walmart and Walmart.com there. And then Sam's also made a pivot, Kath, to a higher income member a few years ago. How's that going? Yeah, so that's going really well. <laughs> um, so the move to a, a member whose um, income is about 100000 a larger family, and what we're seeing is that's driving membership growth and it's also driving traffic. Okay, we'll go to... Uh, go and then yeah. I'll go next. How about that? Just one more time, sorry, on the flip cart. Um, piece of this. Um, the way that I would think about this is, you know, we've been really clear. The dilution next year will be roughly in line with the same as you've seen. And I think that's the guidance that we are giving. What I'll tell you about the business is no different to the US. We're thinking about where we invest. We're thinking about where we grow. We're thinking about where we save. We think about new revenue streams. And the great thing about both Flipkart and PhonePay is they've both got lots of levers that they can pull and be really thoughtful about the ways that they do that. Both of them, for example, are thinking about ad tech revenue and they've got this amazingly powerful data engine that sits behind that. And I'm really encouraged by some of the results that I'm seeing from it. Go to Peter next and then we'll go to Karen after that. Uh, Peter Benedict at Baird. Uh, first question on kind of the services around the super center. When do you think you'll be ready to talk uh, about the cadence of the rollout for the health centers? Is that something that we should expect middle of this year, next year? Um, and how does that impact, if at all, kind of your optical strategy, uh, what you're currently doing in the stores? That's my first question. Yeah, I think um, we'll, uh, let me first talk about what we've got open. We've got two centers open in Dallas, Georgia. We just opened our second in Calhoun a few weeks ago. And I think we're, encouraged by the demand we're seeing. The number of consumers who are looking for options for healthcare that's quality and affordable is encouraging. Now what we've got to do over the next few months is, is learn how the model works and the right mix of services and how we price services. So that's work to be doing. But, but we want to be able to get through this and get a clear understanding of where we're going with it over the next few months. And in addition to just those two services, we also got, we have a big pharmacy business where we think there's more opportunity to, to serve patients in ways other than just filling prescriptions. So think about the ability in, in the right places for, for our pharmacists to practice up in their license and help with mild diagnosis, another opportunity that we can, we can explore over time. And then the second part of your question? Well, just uh, how would it impact, if, it, if at all, kind of your current optical strategy, the optical services? Yeah, op OK. Optical is an important part of it. Um, we've, we've got a good optical business. We've got a remodel program. Uh, that's very encouraging optical. We modernized the shop and, and things inside it. Um, we've got equipment where we're learning about um, checking your vision from remote locations and using technology to streamline the consumer experience. But, but both businesses are, are quite encouraging. We know there's a big demand for it. And then, Judith, maybe one for you. Just your latest thinking around the monetization path for the Indian assets. Um, and, and as you think about assets like Sam's Club and Great Value, how do you maybe use those assets in markets that maybe you don't want to operate in as a, you know, as a corporate entity? Is there, are there ways to kind of maybe sweat those assets a little more? Thanks. Yeah, so the, I think I've talked about the monetization path within the Indian businesses. Um, it's a really interesting one in terms of us learning skills in new areas, but also thinking about use cases that can create some profitability as well for those. The one that's interesting is actually the question on Sam's Club and how do you think about that? Um, you may remember that we did a transaction last year with Brazil. And one of the things we're doing in Brazil is we're still supporting the Sam's Club, although Avent is the owner of those and they run those. And as part of that, we still provide some of our Members Mark products into that. We still talk about how the operation runs. We still provide some training expertise to it as well. So it's a really interesting one where we're learning how we could support that in a market where we already have a 20% 
stake within it. So no further plans other than to learn at the moment, but it's an interesting experience for us to make sure that we can operate something in a way that can be externalized. Um, yeah, Karen Short, Barclays. Uh, John, so you mentioned that there was, uh, you did a click and collect you know, order and you noticed there was some friction that you think you can work through. So I'm wondering if you could just provide a little more color on that. And then with respect to the in-home tests that you're doing now, can you give an update on how many customers you have and then what would be the gating factor on really aggressively, more aggressively rolling it out? Yeah, let me talk about the, uh, the shopping space first. Um, you know, first, the grocery pickup business that we built is, is a great offer for customers. It's got a really clear way for customers to shop in food and consumables. It offers a little bit of general merchandise and the operations done a great job of growing not only with new stores, but the comps have been encouraging for the stores have been open for more than a year and some over, over two years. And then on the other side, we've got an application that's we call the Blue App and it has general merchandise in it that mostly comes from the site or from the marketplace, but inside that are embedded some really great applications for in-store tools, things like maps, lists, and customers use those and they like those tools a lot. So what's gonna happen over the course of the year, we've already got about half of our users in an environment where they've got both apps in one place and then we'll be building out an experience where you'll have search that helps you look across the portfolio, a basket where you can ring up multiple things, and then we've got to simplify care and the experience when you go to the store to pick up or when you have something delivered to home. It's just hard for a customer right now that at times you have to flip back and forth between the app and then you have to navigate different fulfillment options. So we want to bring that all together and make it more seamless. Um, on in-home, uh, the, uh, the retention rates are high. We haven't, we haven't disclosed how many customers that are using it this time. It's only in three markets, but we're very encouraged by what we're learning. Um, the NPS scores are high. Um, the, the customer satisfaction that come along with that and the comments we back are outstanding. And it's just one more way that a customer can decide to have Walmart as a brand take friction out of their lives. And you know, whatever is on your shopping list, it'd be great. The most important thing is they come home and those are in the refrigerator and constantly stocked. So we're we're encouraged by what we're learning so far. And we didn't take it to every store in Kansas City or in Pittsburgh. It's a small number of stores, so it's a pretty small sample size right now. Sorry, just on that. Any color on the demographics of the customer base? Um, I th not, not yet. Um, that we, I don't think it's big enough that we would, we would be able to, to tell you any that you know their insights as far as demographics. But um, just generally speaking, it's, it's pretty encouraging to see the number of people who are loving the service. Um, and, with it, and with every delivery business, whether it's in home or Spark Delivery, um, one of the challenges that we'll work through over the next few months is getting density in an area because the more customers you can deliver to in a neighborhood or a, a suburb, then it brings the efficiency of the delivery process and the cost down per delivery. It's also encouraging to see the percentage of customers that are new to Walmart as well. That's very exciting. One of the things that I learned when I went to visit the Kansas City test a few weeks ago is that our own associates are using the service. Um, it's 20 bucks a month, and while our sample size is small, our associates make up a small percentage of that small pool, but a bunch of them are delivering into each other's homes and love it. <laughs> so all, you know, all kinds of people are gonna use this service. It's been fun to watch them deal with each other's dogs and things like that. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go to Scott first, and then we'll go to Kate, all in the back. Thanks, Dan. Uh, again, Scott Mushkin from R5 Capital. So I wanted to, you know, about 70% of your business is consumables. You throw a pharmacy in there. It's clear that you guys, with Omnichannel becoming bigger in that business, have a lead uh, with what you've done on click and collect and now delivery. I guess sitting back, though, you know, the race is on to improve economics. You've got Kroger that's partnered with Ocado, uh, Amazon that now has cut all their fees and are doing it for free. So how do you guys defend your, your lead um, and use, whether it's micro-fulfillment, I'm a little surprised there's only a couple more of those. How do you continue this lead uh, and maybe even grow share in an environment where you know, your competitors look right now that maybe they're gonna have automation sooner? Well, step, step one is you have to run a great operation. Um, you know, we're really proud of the progress that's been made in the stores and 
Suresh talked about something earlier called the substitutability engine, which is great, but the best way to deal with substitutes is you should be in stock. The grocery areas, we've got to stay in stock. And, and what's exciting about learning how to manage this pickup business in addition to the way we've managed stores over time is we've got an interesting inflow of information from customers telling us all the things they want to buy and how they want to buy them, which is going to lead us to a better way of designing modulars and assortments store by store. So I'm pretty excited about being able to put this customer lens into everything we do inside the store. Um, the second is uh, we've got more stores to go. Um, and I don't want to you know, say that that's where all the growth is going to come from, but that'll help the more markets that we can cover and get the service out. And then third, you know, adding on the, the ability to be able to fulfill this in a number of ways that seamless is probably the thing. I've said this a couple times, and I'll just say it again. It's what I'm most excited about is bringing these two apps together and having a customer-centered view of how we think of all the things in their lives, whether it's a busy Saturday and they're trying to get refreshments for the soccer game or it's a birthday party or the weekly grocery shop or the new deli that we can have either one of our associates go into or a service pick up and run dinner home. We've got a really great portfolio there. We've just got to build it all out so that the customer thinks of us as default the way that Doug's mother thought about when she went shopping at Walmart. I think the speed of automation is important. It's also important to get the right kind of automation. And when you think about the stores, as we've done with Alphabot, having the same inbound freight and some of the last mile being shared with this automation on the side of the box instead of some huge center that does grocery automation, that's an interesting choice that time will tell which one was the right one. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go to Kate next. Okay, Kate McShane, Goldman Sachs. Um, my question is on gross margin. Um, it sounds like you're implying that it will be down this year. I think that was answered earlier. But what would have, have to happen for gross margins to be stable to up, even if it is a continued error of price investment? I don't know that we want gross margins to be stable or up because we want to drive the productivity loop. We just have to get the SG&A savings to be at a faster rate than the gross margin investments that we make, Kate. So I don't think there is necessarily a place where we rest on gross margin. I think we're constantly going to be trying to find a way to give a better value to customers. Yeah, I think the, the uh, I talked about it earlier, the sustainable way to drive everyday, everyday low price is by bringing the cost down. And the best way to bring cost down is to sell more because cost is a denominator. And um, then if you can continue to chase SG&A down, line by line expense management, and I talked about a few of those earlier, we'd like margins to reflect the, the decrease in SG&A because we want to give customers a better value. Thank you. Go to Greg Malik right up front, and then we'll go to Kelly right after that. Thanks. Hi, Greg Malik, Clever Price. I, John, maybe to follow up on that, if we went back at Sam's a couple years ago, I think the decision to repurpose 60 clubs as fulfillment centers and really move ahead on omni-channel. Mm -hmm. Now that you've had a few months in the Walmart US role, do you see a similar shift in how you use those assets to optimize uh, for productivity going forward, or is it a totally different kind of shift uh, in the US? Well, we're still, we're still thinking through the entire supply chain from end to end, and so I don't think I'd be ready to say today um, the right way to design the supply chain, whether it's the fulfillment centers, distribution center stores, or number of nodes we've got to work through and make sure we're serving the customers the best way we can. Um, the stores are stores people shop in that also fulfill. So I, I don't want the message to be that we're thinking of the stores as fulfillment centers where you shop. They are stores that can fulfill. And what we've done in the business I think is quite helpful is, is, is maximizing and optimizing the number of slots and then creating the minimal amount of disruption so that stores can be great super centers with a great produce department, meat department, bakery and have a really high-functioning general merchandise area all throughout the building, but we can still fulfill orders at a pretty high rate. Yeah. Sorry, Judd, I'm just going to add to that, which is, you forget, we've got a business in the UK, which is a home shopping business, which is online shopping, which is 15 years old. They've got some higher densities already, higher pick rates. They've been at this a much longer period of time. And there is still, they don't have a completely different layout in the stores, but the density of pick in many cases will be higher. So I think there is still a lot of learnings that we can do through that. China, though, the other way, they're starting to lay out stores slightly differently so that they can respond much faster as the time to deliver is coming down rapidly. You know, that we're trying to sort some of the deliveries out in 40 minutes. 
So it evolves as well with the customer offer and we've got this benefit of seeing around the world how different people are doing it learning from how you drive density so you don't have to go to dark stores but equally if you do have to change their layouts a little you can do that without disrupting the customer's experience and Keth we are pleased with the e-commerce fulfillment that's happening out of those clubs that we're using yeah we are so we've seen over the last year one it helped us grow so it gave us extra capacity but it also helped us substantially um, reduce our shipment cost as well our, our, our fulfillment cost side of it as well the other part that I think is exciting is looking at Ship From Club, which gives you a whole other, you know, 600 stores, which you can use as points to leverage as well. And that, in, you know, as if we look at Club Pickup, Ship From Club, um, Direct to Home, and using these, these clubs that we've turned dark, it's really given us a, a great kind of network to go after the Omni sale. And Doug, my follow-up for that, and, and you can pass it off as you want, um, if I think about how we expand the addressable market, for Walmart and also monetize all this great customer traffic and productivity loop. Uh, I think we bought Jet, we bought Flipkart as ways to expand. Amazon's built an $11 billion advertising business. Uh, I think in the past we talked about you know, partnering potentially with Hulu or Roku, other things you could do. Picture it, and I think it's more organic than through acquisitions. There may be periodic acquisitions, you know, obviously can't rule that out, but the opportunity to build digital products, which is part of the point of the panel, you've now got a situation where across the company we're learning how to build experiences that you can monetize and tack on to the core business. I think I said something earlier about we're attaching digital products and businesses to the people and physical core businesses that we built over time, that's a big opportunity. And it can relate and will relate to financial services. We have a financial services business now in the US. Obviously, we've talked a lot about phone pay today. There's an opportunity in Mexico that exists across the company in all these different markets. In the US, you can weave in with payment more successfully than we have so far other use cases that help drive a financial services wheel. Then there's healthcare services. Um, advertising has grown faster than sales. Um, we want to be thoughtful about how we grow that advertising business and not have it pollute the customer experience, either online or in store. Um, so there's kind of a, a management governor on how big and how fast we want to make that, but it will grow faster than sales. We've got a great opportunity to do that. Are there others? Yeah, there are. We are choosing not to make a big investment in digital entertainment. Um, there's plenty of money being used by others to do that. We can use ours to do something else. And so there will be an opportunity for us to have partnerships in the digital entertainment space. And as we've described to you before, we do think about what's strategic and core that would cause us to lean towards can we build it. As it relates to acquisitions, can they bring speed and expertise that would be better than building? And then with what's left, how do you partner to create open systems where people win-win? We have a history of enabling people to win by doing business with Walmart. We think that that can be done in the future with all kinds of people beyond just product suppliers. we will go to Kelly next. Thanks. Um, Kelly Bania, BMO Capital. A um, couple of uh, e-commerce related questions. In terms of the initiative to map the general merchandise um, more for the same day avail availability, What's the timing and expectations for that? Because I assume that could have a big impact on, on gross margin there. Um, and then we've talked a lot about in-home, but not as much as um, Grocery Unlimited. And just curious, you know, how that's going, um, what kind of incrementality you're seeing? Are you seeing people kind of, you know, your customers trade up from pickup to, to delivery, or is that a new customer? Just any, any insights on that? Well, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 let me take the second one first. Um, it's a mix. Um, there are, are customers who are shopping in the store who go straight to delivery, others who have moved from the store to pick up, others who have gained from other places, either by pickup or delivery that are now using the service. So um, it's only been a few months, um, but, but encouraging results so far. Um, we're happy with the number of people who have signed up monthly and then annually. Um, so we're, we're happy with that. And then the first part of your question, just to make sure I heard it. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a percentage of the store now that's available uh, for pickup in what we call the orange app. And you know, priority one is to get the apps merged together so that we can start expanding assortments and we can do things like align our catalogs so that we know who our customer is. And with knowing who the customer is who's shopping, that'll help us understanding intent. And you can emerge, align this with a catalog of products 
across the entire store and then, and then beyond the store so that we can be more predictive and serve them in the way they want to be served. But we're, uh, we're working on it every day and meeting on it every week. Expect to make a lot of progress in picking GM in store during the course of the year. So just to repeat something that John said, you can today go out on the grocery app, the orange app, and you could buy back to school. And moms love it. So they just take their, gross, their uh, list from the school and it populates. That's a great example of the fact that we can already do it and how much they want it. But we do have to stitch these two together as soon as we can and, and obviously do that well. I'll just add on one app, and I think it is super important, as John mentioned, but as we start to bring these two together, we're not asking customers to have to download two apps, and so we could really start to leverage that relationship we built on same-day delivery and delivery unlimited and pick up to then sell more long-tail GM on Walmart.com. Um, we've already now we've got about 50% of the traffic on Walmart.com that's seen the grocery app and we're seeing a, a, a nice lift from that. So hopefully when we do it the other way around, and we actually show a blue app, the walmart.com, to grocery customers, we see a similar type of bump. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very important part of our strategy. And I think that's an important point. I, th I think what's interesting is there, there are customers who are only using one app or the other and unaware of the other one. So when we merge them together, seeing customers who are using blue get an orange and vice versa has been encouraging so far. Before I get corrected, I think I said moms can use it. Dads can use it too. I just said moms because it's been moms that have like hugged my neck. Literally, when I go to a store, I almost always go out to the pickup area. And for two years in a row, when I've gone out to that spot, I've seen moms that have a grocery order with their back to school list. And they say things like, I don't have to throw elbow, elbows with the other parents to get my school supplies. Do you know how great this is? And one of them literally hugged me. So moms and dads would both love it, I'm sure. <laughs> We're going to go to the other side of the room, Chris, and then we'll go to Oliver after that. Yeah, uh, Chris Mandeville from Jefferies. Just on Sam's, so a lot of positive comments today. Uh, renewal rates improving, membership count uh, accelerating, or MFI accelerating year on year. But uh, I'm curious, with respect to the guide, how do I square the fact that comps are maybe looking to like, decelerate a little bit on both the one year, two year? Is there something that I might be missing? And then I've got a follow up. Thanks. So sorry, so that I can understand. So did you say that comps are decelerating? Correct, yeah. So the guide is basically three for this coming year, whereas it was three and a half last and two years. It sells a little bit as well. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, we still see there being growth. We're still seeing that we are investing into uh, meeting the member where they want us to from an Omni perspective and also driving traffic. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's down a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it decelerating. Um, and separately, just long-term strategy with respect to capital allocation. Um, you've made a few efforts in pushing upstream in the supply chain. How, how critical is that on a go-forward basis and just any early color with respect to um, the returns that you're seeing thus far? Thanks. Yeah, th the way we're thinking about supply chain, and I'll, I'll talk about the stores first, is We've got a number of experiments going on in the supply chain. Uh, one, we're working through uh, a product called Symbotic in Florida that helps us palletize items for neighborhood markets and for super centers so that they can be delivered on pallets by aisle. And we're pretty, we're pretty excited about the results we've seen so far. But that helps the associates in the store. And as a result of helping the associate, it helps the customer because we're in stock. And as things come in from the back of the store, onto the sales floor, it's much easier for the product to be taken straight to the aisle and, and put onto the counter. So all these things we're doing, whether it's in the dry supply chain, the perishable supply chain, the meat plant, or the dairy plant, we're thinking about the end user in mind, and it's not just a point of assembling something to pull cost out of a silo, because we don't want to sub-optimize. We want to optimize the entire network from top to bottom. Hi, it's Oliver Chen, Cowan and Company. Regarding machine learning, part of the opportunity is scale and the, and the training set. What do you see happening across the connected data set as well as inventory management as you transition to prescriptive analytics? And an emerging topic for younger customers is also privacy and transparency around data. So we'd love your thoughts and I had to follow up. Let me start with, with ML and the supply chain. Um, we're, we're working on processes upstream to help narrow down the, the positive rate of forecasting. In other words, eliminate some of the compounded errors you get because the supply chain starts with the forecast and then as product moves from, from start all the way to finish, variability and things like receiving times or traffic patterns, weather, can create these rates. But as you, as you narrow the, the tolerance down, 
transaction by transaction and work all the failure points out, we can get to a point where inventory is more real time, there's less extra inventory in the store, and I'm pretty excited about some of the work streams that, that the team between uh, Suresh and a person named Serena are working on. So forecasting is a big piece of it. And then we're thinking about, you've heard us talk about perpetual inventory before. We've got products that work on the stores that help us correct on hands if they're wrong, but we're also trying to serve, solve the reason they're wrong with ML from top to bottom so that the store associates have a better experience with on hands being right, which helps us again with in stock. Anything more to add on the customer and data? I think Suresh is still mic'd up. If you would stand up. Yeah. So, um, like you said, the main thing about I'm mic'd up, but I'm not. The mic is not turned on. So, um, in addition to what uh, John was saying, one of the things that we are trying to do with ML is actually make use of the data that we have already that we are already collecting right so there is a bunch of data where we can bring it together in such a way that we can train models on it um, and one of the things that that we are really excited about is that the areas where we can um, where we can draw inferences about customer uh, behavior in such a way that we can actually help the customer experience are the areas where we believe that there is greatest potential okay um, whether it is, I mean, I talked about uh, substitutions as one example, but there are many areas where we can take the, in, the information that, that we have about our, uh, our customer, train models on it, so that we can go back and, and improve the customer experience. And that sets up the, the positive flywheel that, that I was talking about. Supply chain is just one area, but there are many, many of these customer experiences where um, ML is actually going to continue to, to enhance the, the customer experience. Back to the bigger picture of trust and privacy. You know, we feel like we've earned a certain amount of trust from customers over time, and we just want to build that. We certainly don't want to lose it. And Rachel, if you wouldn't mind, grab a microphone. Rachel Brand leads our governance area, compliance, ethics, legal. And uh, Rachel, you recently created a new position within the company to help us think through all these issues. Rachel, Dan Bartlett, myself, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we set the company up to not only have an effective business model, but manage privacy in a way that, it, that accrues trust to the company even more so, especially if you want to do things like be in customers' home, servicing them with groceries, they have, they have to trust us, and they have to trust how we're handling their data. So data and technology is such an important part of the company. It was coming up in just about every conversation I was in. So I took my organization and pulled the existing privacy resources and created a new SVP level, uh, we call it SVP for digital citizenship, which is a term that I came up with to convey that this is not just a legal issue, it's about building trust with the customer. There are a lot of issues adjacent to privacy like responsible use of AI. We want to do all of that in the way that uh, you know, fosters the notion that trust is a competitive advantage for Walmart. So we hired what I like to call a world famous privacy expert, Nula O'Connor, who had recently been the president of an NGO. She's a real expert in both the legal and sort of policy and reputational aspects of privacy and all those issues. So we think we're on the right track. Can I just add on to that um, to say, I think in the past too, we've always used history, whereas we're in a position where now we can look forward. So if you think about a forecast, it's always been, well, what did we sell similar week last year? Now we can actually scrape other people's websites to see what they've got on promotion. We can have a look at social media and see what events are happening. And you also know the individual buying patterns of your members or customers so you can anticipate what they're going to purchase. So it is flipping the world in regard to how you actually get in front of the purchase. And I think about it from a Sam's Club perspective, we're now also tailoring our offers in our instant savings book. So on the back page of the book, we'll actually create offers for individual members to start to draw them along that purchase path because we know that they'll be more loyal and sticky if we get them into members mark. Or we know if we can actually get them to use optical that that becomes a customer or a member who is with you for a lot, lot longer period. And so how do we design offers that actually encourage them to participate with us even more than they have in the past? Great. Good on, Joe. Uh, Joe. Hey, Joe. Um, I actually want to piggyback on that. Where are you with doing that at Walmart? And like, is there potential for a loyalty program at some point at, at Walmart? Maybe it includes the in-home service and some of the other things. Like, ha have you thought about something more comprehensive? Because at, at Sam's Club, you know the customer. You know exactly what they buy. 
But at Walmart, you don't really. You know, you know what masses of people do, but how do you get more tailored to that customer? I, I think in today's world and tomorrow's, we have to personalize for customers. And Walmart's got to create one view of the customer and then put it to work. One of the key questions will be, for which use cases? And we really believe in everyday low price for Walmart supercenters. The benefits of flowing inventory in an EDLP business model are, are significant. So what we wouldn't want to do is start down the path of an old school loyalty program and high-low that creates all this disruption in the supply chain. But there are plenty of use cases. You bought that tie, you'll like this one, or you bought this Nike top, or we don't carry Nike yet in the Walmart stores. I hope they're listening, maybe. Um, you bought this, so you'll want that. You know, you, you, brought a, you bought a printer, so you need ink, or things that you're buying cyclic. Many use cases that we can do using data that will help us earn more trust, drive the loop, and, and we'll do those things, and we'll do it as quickly as we can do it. But we need to be really careful which use cases we adopt within the Walmart brand. Go to Robbie next. Thanks, Robbie Yelms, uh, Bank of America Securities. When a lot of great questions on um, pickup and the app. Just lo longer term, and I think somebody was asking this before, is there, um, is there an opportunity to, to really meaningfully move general merchandise online fulfillment to the store level, and could that start to make your gross margin improve in the dot-com business? Is there, we obviously wouldn't see it in fiscal 21, but you know, how important is that relative to being a comp driver, and how much further can you go in, in fulfilling from store, uh, you know, using shipping partners as well? Is there, are there real opportunities, you know, over a five-year basis to dramatically improve the profitability of the U.S. online? Well, we, we do a few things already, I think, that would help answer the question. Um, as we said earlier, we've got the pickup business, we have general merchandise categories that are in that during seasonal times of the year, and we have the ability now in many stores to deliver from the store to the home. And then as we align these shopping experiences, then we'll be able to pick more and more of the super center and deliver it same day. So we believe that's an important piece of the solution and should have all the benefits you just talked about. But, but again, it's a part of the solution. I wouldn't want to say that delivering from store is the answer because it's a part of the answer. Part of the answer may be deliver from store and deliver from an FC depending on the order or move all of it to the FC. So we're conscious to think through the timing of all these changes and steps and over time build out the ability to do all those things. And then on, sorry, go ahead. No, and just keep in mind the marginal cost to deliver a GM item out of a store when it's already going with the grocery is very small. So that, that's a big opportunity as we expand assortment to sort of leverage the basket. Pharmacy is another good example of being able to get that in the basket to increase size. But ultimately, I think the real opportunity to drive mix is really in that long tail, and we're doing that in, in home and fashion and marketplace. I think that's the really, the really big opportunity. And watch. increasingly happening with a membership fee that goes along with it. Um, you're right, we didn't talk about Delivery Unlimited as much. Uh, that was not necessarily intentional. We have a membership program. We're starting to learn how to, to sell the membership, and it's something we can build on with same-day delivery from the super centers, including GM. And then just on pickup, a couple of times I think Brett said it first. So the stores that are comping pickup, um, what is driving the comp? Is it is it the same people using it more? Is it new people still coming in, and so therefore the pickups are comping? You know, what's what are the bigger drivers to stores that are have pickup and are already it's, comping? It's it's both of those things. Um, over over the last three to four years, as we've expanded, we've seen more frequent usage and we've seen new customers come in to pick up either from uh, somewhere outside of the environment or from inside of the environment. So it's just a mix of all those and really happy with the growth rates we've seen over the last few years. And, and last thing, are there stores where um, pickup is, is too high, where it's, it's uh, creating problems for the shopper experience and things like that? And how, how many stores and, and how do you, what do you do in those situations? Well, we've got a number of things that we've been, been working on. Um, first, um, the time slot issue that uh, Suresh talked about earlier, helping customers find a slot that is meaningful, that works for their schedule and ours as well. So we're trying to do a nice job of spreading out the picking in stores. And then we've got a number of stores and markets. So if you were thinking about a market like Chicago or Dallas, where we've got multiple stores in an area, we're also testing ways to pick in stores while they're closed and then move the inventory um, either through a van that's driven by a person or an automated van or autonomous vehicle so that we can move from place to place. So we're looking at all the ways we can to try to spread the volume out. 
we do cap in quite a few stores. The demand is higher than what we will fulfill because we don't want to destroy the experience in the store, which brings you back to how fast can you automate, where do you automate. I think we probably have time for one more or two more, Rupesh, yep. and then Ed will make you the last one after that. Uh, Rupesh Preek Oppenheimer. So on the grocery delivery front, I was curious what opportunities you see to lower grocery delivery fees. And then as you look at your consumer surveys, um, how important is it to your consumers to have grocery delivery close to zero? What was the last part? How imp as you look at your consumer surveys, how important is free grocery delivery for your consumers? Free, gro free grocery yeah. delivery. We'll end up doing a membership um, in larger numbers, and the fee itself may go down some over time as we figure out autonomous and how we pick. But our front foot will be on a membership fee. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, you've got options today where you can pay by the transaction. You can pay monthly, or you can pay one fee for the year. And so we're just now in the beginning of, of learning which of those customers like the most. And it's only been a couple months, but we'll, we'll learn. Ed, you get the lucky last question. Hi, uh, Kelly Wells Fargo. So just a, uh, a follow-up on, uh, on grocery. And as it relates to pickup, uh, you've clearly led the market uh, in this. Uh, strategy. What do you think the biggest drivers of that have been? How much of it is the fact that you're not charging versus the fact that your peers are? How much of it is related to the fact that operationally the execution just seems better? Um, and then what happens when competitors eliminate their fee? And how does that impact your business? And then unrelated, uh, I did want to ask you about supply chain uh, related to coronavirus. Um, and the question there is, uh, how much of uh, what you're selling is on true replenishment? How much inventory do you have? Um, how long uh, before we need to start worrying about uh, the fact that it could create inventory issues if supply chain in China really doesn't begin to open back up uh, more normally? Yeah. Let me, let me take the first question um, on, on pickup. And I believe the question was, when, when you look across the operation that we have, which is don't charge, and we're able to fulfill customers' baskets today, what happens if others do it? I think then the most important thing that we, we would always focus on, and I think we'll be talking about this next year and years to come, is having the very best quality items and great values inside the store. If you get the assortment right, then the mechanism for delivery it makes it much easier and much easier for us and the customer. But you know, the reason I think the growth is, is it's about the customer. People are busier than they've ever been. We're, we're all trying to tackle lots of things, and this is a great service that fills in a big void. Um, on the second part of the question, um, like we said earlier, it's, it's, it's just early to tell. I mean, you know, we're first concerned about our supplier partners, our associates in the country, our sourcing associates, associates who work in Walmart China. So we're thinking about them first and foremost. And as we learn more about what's going on, we'll be able to tell more of the impacts. I think some categories will be sooner than others, and it just depends on the lead time and how quickly the, the supply chains move in the categories. It is worth saying, John, I think that um, one of the things that we've learned over the last few years through our global sourcing, but our merchants have got much closer to the detail of thinking about how the flow of products come into our business. So they know exactly which orders are in which factories, when they're due to come in, and what that looks like. And I think that attention to detail as we go through this, even though it's such a fluid um, situation, will help us understand better as things become clearer exactly what the impacts for us would be in the future. Great, with that, we're going to wrap up our Q&A. Yeah, I just will close by saying thank you. Um, and Brett may want to say a word too. We, we appreciate the relationship that we have with the investment community. We're trying to do the best job we can for you of laying out what our opportunities are. We've got a really strong team, not just the people that are represented in this room, but um, two million plus that are working to make these things happen. And as we walk out of this room today, we know yesterday is yesterday. We're focused on driving speed, innovation, and execution so that we can continue to have strong results. We appreciate the engagement that we have with you. Yeah, n not that I need to encourage this probably, but keep giving us feedback um, on how we communicate, what we're communicating, how often we're communicating. It helps us get better as we think about these events and other things we do in the future. But, but I really appreciate all the feedback you give us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So with that, the formal part of our meeting has concluded and our webcast has ended. As I mentioned earlier, we have lunch available upstairs where you can spend some time with 
our executive team. Thank you for the interest.